1963. Park Jong-hee takes over the country in a military coup. He rules with an iron fist for 16 years. August 1979. Park Jong-hee ejects opposition party leaders from the national parliament. October 1979. Busan and Masan riot against this. October 26th, same year. Park Jong-hee is assassinated during a dinner by the Korean CIA director. This results in a power vacuum. Chan Du Hwan, head of the military, takes over the government in another coup. This makes him highly unpopular. Protests begin. Now you can see why everyone was so angry. And nothing is angrier than an idealistic young university student. And that's why here, at Jolanamde University, that's where the Gwangju Uprising started. Thousands of students gathered right here around this gate, protesting the martial law and the new military dictatorship. Let's go inside. Let's take a look around. This whole street leading in would have been filled with people all the way up to the end there, which is where we're going. Which brings us to what was the main building here at the university. And this is where a lot of them would have gathered to at the end of that street I showed you. Now you have to keep in mind, they weren't protesting university at all. The intelligentsia, the professors here, they would have been pro-demonstration. So this was nothing to do with the university. It just happened to be where a lot of these young people who were kind of counterculture and the intelligentsia and the professors who were also pro-democracy would have been. So while it started here and would have been outside this building, it had nothing to do with anything anti-university. The universities were the hotbed of dissent back in this 1980-1981 uh, period. So it just started here. But it couldn't contain here. It couldn't stay here. So it was collectively decided to leave the university together and walk down Gumnamro, which goes down to the provincial office. Uh, the provincial office would be where people would protest and actually have a voice against the government. So they decided to pick up camp, leave, go down Gumnamro to the provincial office, and that's where we're going now. And so here we are. This is. Gumnam Ro, Gumnam Street. Why am I saying it like a Korean? Street. Anyway, so from down this way, that's where the university is. Well, well down there. They came this way, all the way down to the provincial government building. Thousands of people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Huge demonstration. And they basically congregated around the fountain, which we'll see later, outside the provincial office building. And that was the main hangout for this demonstration against the military government of uh, still alive piece of shit, John Du Huan. Uh, we'll get into that later, but he was basically arrested and tried for, uh, you know, military crimes against human rights. Uh, and most presidents have been charged after they stopped being president. It's like one or two that haven't. It's almost like a tradition here in Korea where if you serve as president here, you have to be arrested for some kind of corruption scandal after the fact. So let's go down to the provincial office building. That's kind of the central focus point of the entire thing. And I'll show you some stuff on the street. Uh, it's pretty wild. I mean, obviously it's been 40 years, but it's like any other street anywhere else. You can't really tell, <laughs> obviously. Like, you know, there's no bullet holes in the walls. There's no blood on the streets, clearly. It's just, you know, cars going by, old people walking, having a good time. And uh, yeah, let's take a look, see what we can Okay, so I've spoke too soon. Uh, this is the building next to, oh, that's terrible. This is the building next to uh, the provincial government building. I've seen this building many times, I've never been inside, but now they let you inside and I'm on the 10th floor and these little numbers here are all bullet holes on the side of the building. So you can see those things right there. Those are from a helicopter. And I'll show you here too, they're on the floor. They're everywhere, there's 245 of them. So this building came under gunfire from a helicopter gunner in 1980 in May when the uprising was happening and just 
Again, I've never been up here and I can go on the roof, so I'm gonna go up there next and we'll get a good top view of the provincial government building and the fountain outside. There you go, that's the kind of gun that we're talking about from the helicopter. That's some serious shit. That's not like a, that's not your dad's hunting rifle. This is essentially where I am right now. And a sentence I absolutely agree with. Man, this is awesome. This is all brand new. These are the steps up to the observatory. So I'll take you up there and we'll check it out. I've actually always dreamed of coming up here. <laughs> and they've made it into an observatory deck. So that's amazing. Take off my mask up here. So let's take a look. So if you see that street there, I came from down this way. So people would have marched and then congregated all around here, around this fountain. Tens of thousands of people. All here in this square and on the surrounding streets. That, across the way, is the old provincial office uh, that would have been Jalanamdo's, you know, provincial government bureaucracy. And this street here, like I said, is where a lot of the fighting happened. This building here is the gymnasium, and it has a very sad history. This is where all the dead protesters were brought and then lined up on the floor. Uh, just hundreds and hundreds of them. So uh, I'll try and get in there later, but very sad building indeed. You can also see how seriously Guangzhou takes this stuff, and as, as they should. But I'm in this building across the street, and it has like a memorial hall that I just showed you. This entire old provincial office has, you can see the 518 there sign right there. And this entire building is another kind of like experience and historical museum. So they take it very seriously here. And uh, another fun fact, that's Mudungsan National Park up there. And that is Joseon de Hakyo. And I always love looking at that building. It looks like some kind of weird retro future Swiss Alps cabin. And for posterity's sake, while I'm up here, I'll give you a full kind of 360 here. There's downtown Guangzhou. Apartments. Also, fun fact, if you've seen the movie A Taxi Driver, uh, Jürgen Hintzpeter was up here filming. He was over on the roof over on this side, looking down onto the street, uh, filming the shooting and the beatings and the riots and stuff. Uh, so he would have been standing just over this way when he was filming down onto the street below. Kind of interesting filming from the same place he was in the same spirit of freedom and democracy but i'm in no danger though so don't i'm not elevating myself <laughs> to, to that status don't get the wrong idea so i've just come from up there on the roof of that building again this building's been here forever this was here during the uprising it's right beside the fountain and this is essentially the birthplace of Korean democracy as we know it. And this is not to discount the protests that happened in Busan and Masan and in Seoul, obviously. But this was a big one, and this was the one that got crushed the most violently. Just hundreds dead, thousands in prisons and charged. And this really woke the people up in this country to, like, you know, it's not good enough to keep your mouth shut and make money and take care of your family. If you're going to try and protest something and you want your freedoms, you're going to get crushed for it. We better do something now, after, and before something even worse happens. Park Chung-hee had ruled for 16 years. He was assassinated, like I said. There was a chance to start something different then, but again, 
military is going to military. Jom Du Hwan took over and it was going to be more of the same unless someone did something and the people here in the city stood up for what they thought was right and a lot of them paid the price for it but it started, it started that little seed in the beginning of the 1980s and it really didn't fully take off until the early 90s but that first sprout, that first idea and that first movement to kind of get it off the ground was right here where I am right now in front of this fountain and in front of this old provincial office and being a poli sci graduate and someone who hates dictators I think I mean that's not exactly a brave stance but I've always found the city fascinating and this area especially you know I've called this place my home for a long time and you know I, I I'm not sure I'd want to live here in the 1980s when things were cracked down and you couldn't say what you want you still can't say exactly what you want all the time with willy-nilly but you know, I love it here, I've lived here a long time, and I'll continue living here, and, and I have to thank the good people of this city quite a bit for making this place a lot more bearable for someone who, again, takes for granted the fact that I can vote in Canada, and that, you know, I, I might not love Justin Trudeau, but he's not kicking down my door for running around in public with a sign saying that he's a fucking idiot, you know what I mean? So, much respect to the people here. Much respect to the culture here, and much respect to the history here. And there, uh, like I said on the roof, there's the gymnasium where they kept the people who died during the uprising. So I'm going to go over there and see what happens. It is in fact locked, but you can see here too. The victims of the uprising were laid temporarily here during the days of the Gwangju Democratic Uprising. After witnessing the bodies of those who were sacrificed by the mass shooting and brutal suppression, the citizens cried without rage at the barbarous acts committed by the martial law forces. Citizens formed long lines to offer incense and pay their respects for the victims, once again reaffirming their determination to fight for democratization. Speaking of violent protests, uh, there is a sign here for the people of Myanmar. You can see everything will be okay. There's a map of Myanmar. Pray for Myanmar. As uh, an ex-British colony, much as Myanmar is, I, they are completely different things, obviously, but they're still ex-British colonies. Uh, hope and pray for Myanmar. But this shows you the Guangzhou spirit of, like, supporting those who are in these kinds of situations with these violent government forces versus the people who just want to, you know, Maybe write on the internet that the president is an asshole or walk down the street and say what they want without fear of retribution from the forces that be, whether it be police, military police, or secret service. So um, that wraps up our time here outside the fountain and the provincial office. Now we're going to go to kind of the darkest place, which is our final part of the tour, and that is the prison where they took the political prisoners. To be interrogated. So let's get on the subway, let's go to the prison, and then we'll end our tour there. And so when you capture all of these protesters, and all of these rioters, and all of these dangerous individuals, where do you put them? You put them here, in a military prison. This entire place was actually the military police for Guangzhou. And after the uprising, it was actually repurposed, and it was kind of a joint collaboration between uh, the intelligence agency, the national one, uh, military police, local police, and special investigation units from the federal government. So this was repurposed, and it was turned into, behind me, uh, investigation rooms. And then over there was more of like the prison area. And there's also like a courtroom too, which I'll show you later. The whole thing is farcical. You were brought in, you're investigated, you're forced to confess. Uh, under torture and duress. It's just a nightmare and I'll show you more inside. We'll go check out the investigation rooms. These protesters were brought in here for three days and three nights. They were stripped naked. They were beaten with pickaxes, it says, five pound pickaxes. They had five centimeter long nails put under their fingernails and then shoved up. They were tied to the bars and left overnight, standing up, so they had to piss and shit themselves. They were forced to admit that they were North Korean spies, 
or that they were uh, allies of Kim Dae-jong, which was one of the opposition leaders, not even in Gwangju necessarily, but just to the national government generally in Korea. And uh, just absolute nightmare, absolute nightmare. These people were protesting a military dictatorship, martial law. They were in their own city downtown with signs and you get stuck in a room like that for three days and three nights. And that's just the beginning. Three days and three nights of torture and just absolute. Uh, it says too there was people who couldn't sleep for years afterwards. They had a hard time getting jobs. They have criminal records now. And this, this isn't theft, <laughs> you know? This isn't a criminal record in the normal sense of that. This is like, you know, anti-government activism, terrorist charges that you have on your criminal record now. So good, you know, good luck getting a job anywhere with that. Just absolutely atrocious, horrible. I can do planks. I do four sets of 36 seconds. But what I'm not doing is this, if you can imagine. Being forced to suspend yourself on your feet and your head at risk of being beaten. Now I'm in the mess hall uh, where the police would eat and the interrogators, all the people interrogating and doing the beating would eat and you'd think that'd be a relatively normal affair and it is there are some tables there's a kitchen over there but it gets worse it's not merely a mess hall it couldn't be that simple could it it has to be a man getting drowned in a sink And this brings us to the actual prison part where they were kept and held. And like, this is not a regular prison. It's really small. And they weren't here for like a month or two. Some of these people were in here for years. So again, just to emphasize how much of a nightmare this would be, you know, prison's bad enough. This is, this is another level of prison. And when you think that doing planks on the ground can't get any worse, more fighter jets. Uh, when you think planks can't get any worse, it can always get worse. I mean, there's a human centipede joke in here, but it's bad enough without being compared to that. Are you ready? These cells held 150 people and they sat upright 16 hours a day. 16 hours a day. And if they moved even a little bit, they were beaten by the guards. They were given two meals a day. It was some rice in a bowl, that's it. And uh, I was wrong about being here for years. They were transferred to a real prison, but they stayed here, still sucks, for three months. So these rooms were basically split up based on how involved you were in the uprising. So leaders would have been more punished and then, you know, some kid who was just maybe involved in the street protesting, maybe not so much, but kneeling for hours, sitting up straight for hours, don't move, move when we tell you, here's some rice. You can see, like, imagine eating that for three months, unimaginable. I like rice, but holy hell. Apparently some collaborators get a piece of radish kimchi if they're lucky. Bon appétit. And I can't emphasize enough that this is not a museum. Like, it's the prison. Like, this is the real place. Obviously, there's reenactments of prisoners here, but this is the legit cell where all of this went down 41, well, 40 years ago. It's hard to overstate the fact how horrific this would have been. It's 34 degrees today. I'm sweating. I, I don't enjoy this. There would have been 150 people in here packed in with no air conditioning, no fans, a couple of windows at the back there, big fucking deal, and just staying in here 16 hours a day, unimaginable. The Panopticon. If anyone has seen this movie, A Taxi Driver, uh, you'll recognize this guy over here as the journalist who snuck in took a bunch of video and then snuck out again. It's all a true story. It's dramatized in the movie, clearly. I really don't think there was a taxi car chase out of the city and all the other taxi drivers came and helped 
that didn't come. I, I can guarantee. Good movie nonetheless if you haven't seen it. And here we get to sentencing. So uh, if you look at the outside of this building, shown here, uh, you'll see that this is a different kind of brickwork. It's a different kind of architecture. And that's because this building was built specifically for the trials of the people who were arrested in coordination with the protests. So that was because they didn't want the public in the courtrooms that are, you know, in downtown Guangzhou, where they could be seen. These were like clandestine kangaroo courts with military judges. Th again, this is not like getting arrested for shoplifting and going to the courtroom. This is a completely different animal. Uh, no one had lawyers. They were not informed of their right to lawyers. They were kept in that prison that we saw earlier, and then they were brought in here, where you would sit in the front there, and you would be judged not by a group of your peers, but by five colonels from the military who were not there to listen to you. You were being sentenced. So uh, there were 1,900 people, roughly, that were arrested from the riots, or the protests, I should say. And there were 600 people arrested and charged later and not released. A bunch of them were released uh, with warnings. But there were 616 people who were uh, then charged formally. And some were sentenced to prison after. Some were sentenced to death. Again, it's hard to believe, having lived here for eight years, teaching and you know drinking beer outside of 7-Eleven and making Korean friends and for all intents and purposes, this is a modern country, and if the G8 was the G8, they would be the A. And this is only 40 years ago. It's so hard to believe that this was happening <laughs> only 40 years ago, four years before I was born. <clears throat> there I was growing up on a quiet tree-lined street in Canada without a care in the world, and there were still people in prison for protesting against martial law and a military dictatorship here, where my new home is. Hard to fathom. Come on, honey, let's take a selfie with the tortured prisoners. So there's a museum next to the prison, and this is where I'll end today. I'll show you some stuff inside, but come here yourself and look inside. But seriously, if you come, grab this book. It's by the door, it's free. Honestly, if you want to know exactly what happened and everything that had happened during those four or five days for the uprising, it's all in this book. Seriously, it's like the only thing you need to read about what happened before and why and then during and then what happened after like the entire story it's about yay thick pick this up this is why i know so much about this uprising is because i've read this and i've been to guangzhou a bunch of times fascinating stuff important stuff pick up a copy while you're here one of the most impressive things in this museum and depressing uh, is this flag here and you can see it's the Korean flag but it's this was one of the flags used to cover one of the bodies of the protesters who had died so that's that's real blood and that's the real flag that was used to cover their body just I don't know powerful stuff